and putting it onto Facebook Live. There we go. And I shall mute everyone and hand over to Mark. Well, welcome everybody to this wonderful episode, The Perfume Show, where we hear from Henry Hoke, Moira Egan, Megan Volpert, and Donna De La Pierre. Um, and thank, many thanks to Megan for uh, making this particular episode happen. Um, and before we commence the featured show, uh, I'm gonna introduce first our missing co-host, Jonathan Penton, who founded Unlikely Stories, an electronic journal of literature and art in 1998. He's lent his editorial and management assistance to many literary and artistic ventures, including the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry a year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chap, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods, Standards of Sanity, and the Free E Chapbook Backstories, which you can download from Argotist eBooks. And I have one of Jonathan's poems to read. They're one of his ekphrastic poems based um, on the sculptures in, uh, the, in New, New Orleans. So this one's called Monumental Head of Jean Dare. We know that pride comes from both directions. We know of the character earned with time contrasted with the haughtiness of youth. We know how it feels to be trapped in the middle. And I know, you know, we always did. O sculptor, sculpt thyself as Ganymede or Onate. Place yourself in every work of art from Mona Lisa to Mickey Sabbath. Now poet, find thyself in the New Orleans sculpture garden, but bring each reader along. Tell them sculptures are worth more than bronze. Poems are worth more than paper. Aging can build character, but character can come through art and we needn't suffer each tragedy of Rodin to learn each thing he knew. So that one is by Jonathan Penton. And next we have from Cassandra herself, who's an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books are of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry and Introduction and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She's also commissioning editor for Westley Magazine. I'm gonna read a prose poem because I only write prose poetry and I tried to find something with perfume or smell in it. Um, and it's very tenuous, but I'll go with it anyway. It's uh, based on the La Belle Dame Sans Merci 1893 painting. When I leave, you call me La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Keep my purple underwear for an empty ransom and breathe in my perfume from the pillowcase. For months, you play breakup songs while eating crumpets with honey in the mornings and roasting sweet potatoes in the afternoon. You tell your friends I'd worn my cold heart on my sleeve and they say you should have been suspicious of a barefooted woman. After long nights with my lasso of red hair haunting your neck, you'll say you'll spend, you say you'll spend eternity imagining the sound of other men surrendering on my sheets. I would like to introduce the intrepid Mark Vincennes. He is. An Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, a translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist and musician. He has published over 20 books of poetry, including more recently, A Brief Conversation with Consciousness, There Might Be a Moon or a Dog, which has just come out from Gazebo Books in Australia, 39 Wonders and Other Management Issues, forthcoming from Spite and Dival, and The Pearl Diver of Irin Marnie, forthcoming from White Pine Press. He's busy, but he's prolific. An album of music, ambience and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincennes is also a prolific translator, and he's translated from, and all the regulars know German, Romanian, and French. He's published 10 books of translations, most recently, Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz. 
White Pine 2018, and it was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Mertz's selected poems and Audible Blue is hot off, well, hot off the computer screen of translation and forthcoming in September from White Pine Press. He's currently working on a novel, which is wonderful, called The Age of Occasions. He is editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. He's lived all over the world, joined in from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the Peak in Hong Kong, but he now lives on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where there are more, drum roll, assassin bugs, Orgochlorus sweat bees and small eyed sphinx moths than people. You always change it up for me, Mark. I never quite know what my last line is going to be on a Sunday morning. That one was pretty good. Yeah, I was always looking for a little bit of alliteration, you know. Um, this is a prose poem called Down in Star Time from the collection that I'm working on, All the Tricks of Language. If you believe all the questions that arise from above, the queen stares down in all her mercy. Know that everything fades out too, even these moments on the prow across the pier. Know that history changes nothing. Everything which is transforming will continue. All these damned questions. And in your form, one of the living few, yes, you protrude, grazing my shoulder, a leaking light, and clock, the clock's hand expand in space, as if whether those of another star time were a single groove, a thin line on a paper cut moon, a childhood rewind, memories from the deep siesta, the message that has been carried on, the tales of strange creatures like moray eels spinning into their tails, the boundless herring, the storm of fish darting through the shattered beams of ancient trawlers and fishing vessels, a cargo of ships laden with amphorae, olive, honey, and wine, casks of salt or bolts of silk, beeswax and twine, and treasures from the secret cellars of Mycenae, jewels too, or in fact, the meat of the wounded spring lamb, a panapticom, a pandemonium of flavors, everything that descended vicariously, and all those trade winds headed south, deep into the back country, into the rock beds, and into the wings of the cormorant, see? She is transfixed. She wishes she had the wings to carry her away. And now I am delighted to present the first of our features tonight, and that is Henry Hoke, who is the author of five books of fiction, memoir, and poetry. Most recent stickler from Bloomsbury, Open Throat, a novel is forthcoming in 2023 from MCD, FSG, and Picador. He edits humor at the offing and lives in New York City. Welcome, Henry. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, everyone. This is lovely and uh, excited for Megan and Perfume. And uh, I'm a fellow Object Lessons author. This is my sticker book. Um, it's a memoir in 20 stickers. Um, and I'll be reading one of them. Um, it was the most fragrance based of them. Um, it's called Blueberry. Um, throughout the book, I talk about scratch and sniffs, and this is the chapter that focuses explicitly on the scratch and sniff, so. Blueberry. Scratch and sniffs changed our relationship to all stickers. Once we'd had our first whiff of them, every other sticker was suspect. Was this one a scratch and sniff? We'd tear at each adhesive with our little nails, huff everything up our developing nostrils, false fruit blending with the smell of rotting picnic tables and the taste of Lunchables, chemical bliss. The magic of scratch and sniff, of smells emerging from flat nothing, boggled our young minds, but the science was pretty simple. Developed in 1965 by the 3M company as a supplemental use of their micro encapsulation technology, normally employed to seal ink on carbonless copy paper, Scratch and sniff stickers are created by printing tiny sealed dots of scented oil onto surfaces. When these dots are punctured by a simple scratch, the fragrance they hold is released. Each scratch and sniff had a washed out aesthetic, perhaps rooted in their 1970s and 80s heyday. Their simple illustrations and lightly ridged, alluring surfaces already felt a bit bygone. 
I have one iconic Matt sticker in mind, a bursting basket of blueberries, motion lines popping out of little blue fruits as they tumble, printed in bright green letters above, wild. I ate blueberries an hour ago and I couldn't describe what they smell like, but in an instant, in any situation, I can conjure up the scent of a blueberry scratch and sniff as if I've just scratched, just lifted it to my nose. So much of my childhood was recorded. Dad would haul out the bulky VHS video camera and tape us at play or in celebration, toddling and team sports. These tapes are collected in a makeshift museum, the drawers under mom's TV. Mom never throws any of our things away. This hoarding is connected to her own childhood experience, her own trauma. When she returned home from her long time at the hospital and in rehab after her paralyzing teenage accident, she found that most of her kid possessions were gone disposed of in preparation of a ground floor room for the start of her paraplegic adulthood. She wouldn't do that to us boys. Our toys and books and games collect dust and will continue to do so until we decide to go through and dispose of them ourselves, which she always encourages us to do and which we won't. If we wanna fact check a memory, we can easily grab the VHS and confirm. When we watch and find out exactly, we can watch and find out exactly what we wore, exactly what we shouted at the parent behind the camera. But the smells can't be captured. Their archive exists only in our synapses. We forget, but we remember. In her book, The Future of Nostalgia, Svetlana Boehm describes the nostalgic as someone who is never a native, but a displaced person who meditates between the local and the universal. I identify as a nostalgic. If my Charlottesville was a scratch and sniff, it'd smell like pine trees, eyeballs, honeysuckle, a synthetic bouquet. My nostalgia isn't for the real thing, the real town, the real childhood. I opened my nose one morning during Obama's first term and realized my love's body lotion reminded me of a cereal I used to gobble at dad's post-divorce house. The cereal was a tie-in for a blockbuster sequel from 1992 a limited time only product that vanished from shelves for good in a matter of months. Life was stagnating when I got a whiff of the body lotion and in stagnation, I tend toward indulgence. I found an unopened box of the cereal for sale on eBay. Grateful to live in the ideal moment for nostalgia addicts, I clicked buy it now. In three days, I was tearing open the box. A glow in the dark sticker packed in vacuum sealed plastic tumbled into my bowl along with the ancient marshmallows and chocolate checks. I poured on almond milk and devoured the stale pile. Bite by bite, the flavors pulled me back in time. I could feel the fructose stunting my growth all over again. A few weeks later, I received my master's degree and the next morning I passed out at Six Flags and the park cop referred to me as a juvenile. My last thought before blacking out was of that undead bowl that bliss, every taste was intact, mummified by preservatives. It's the fake shit that endures. Thanks. That was amazing. I think we were expecting you might read a little bit longer. Is there another little tasty morsel you might have for us? Oh, you're on mute. You were, that was so good. I'd forgotten all about scratch and sniff. I used to like the pickle one. We had pickle scratch and sniff. Yeah. Oh, those were dreamy. That were the days. I, <laughs> how long, how much more should I read? A little bit longer? Yeah, absolutely. It was so great. I was so entranced and I'm like, no, you can't finish. <laughs> okay. I'll read the beginning of the book. Awesome. Mr. Yuck. Mr. Yuck was my first crush. His face dotted the containers in the underbelly of the kitchen sink. His tongue protruded from the upper shelves of the medicine cabinet, taunting me. Mr. Yuck was famous. He even had his own theme song that would play on PBS between shows. Mr. Yuck is mean. Mr. Yuck is green. We don't touch if we see Mr. Yuck, warned mom. The sticker wielded a dark power. The doctor that designed Mr. Yuck had an altruistic mission to prevent accidental poisonings with a universal symbol that the smallest of children could register as bad, a color that any kid would find repellent. The skull and crossbones wasn't working anymore. Pirates were all a kid could ever want to be, and the bottles they adorned were inviting to ingest. 
as soon as my little brother was old enough to pick out his own clothes, he would drape himself in a dress sized t-shirt that was fully covered in photorealistic skulls. In Pittsburgh, where Mr. Yuck was invented, the Pirates were the major league baseball team. A kid could mistake toxic substances for sports juice, the skull and crossbones, an endorsement. Drink me. The focus group used to choose Mr. Yuck's details was composed of the potentially poisoned themselves, some 70s Pennsylvania tykes. Dr. Richard Moriarty and an ad agency subjected them to various designs to find out what they were drawn to, what alarmed them. They were asked what happens if they messed with poison. Your mother will yell at you, they responded. You'll get sick, you'll die. When given a range of options, they chose the sick face over the yelling face or the dead face. Yuck had to be a mister. Their mothers were the ones looking out for them. All the man of the house could do was register a repulsion. So Mr. Yuck, this nemesis of smiley face, eyebrows knit in pain, nauseated tongue extended, was born in fluorescent green and stuck, a new icon. Today on the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center website, I can buy a sexy pink t-shirt emblazoned with my old crush. It promises to be incredibly soft with great drape. Get to know his face in every single place. The same year that Mr. Yuck was introduced, 1971, a children's book series called Mr. Men arrived. Simple and colorful, the Mr. Men were named for their one defining attribute, the yellow Mr. Happy, the fat pink Mr. Greedy, the squiggly pink Mr. Messy. I was born 12 years later and was immediately gifted these colorful Mr. Books. In my developing brain, Mr. Yuck was one of the Mr. Men crew and by far the best. The Mr. Men in the books couldn't be removed. They stayed flat and unstickable, confined by their covers. But Mr. Yuck was everywhere. I'd seen mom with a whole roll of Mr. Yucks to peel and place on bottle after bottle. And I knew that this roll was still lurking somewhere in the house. Home is full of bad things that can hurt you very much. Dr. Moriarty and his team speculated that kids might not really pay attention to the sticker, but the act of stickering would make parents more cautious about the toxic products in their house, where and how they stored them and kept them from teeny hands and growing throats. I learned early to open the safety latch on the cabinet below the sink. I'd take out a bottle of whatever deadly liquid and gaze at Mr. Yuck. He held the forbidden behind his grimace. I saw a reflection of my own face, my own disgust mirrored. I'd knit my eyebrows just so. I fuck with Mr. Yuck, I thought, but didn't think because children don't think fuck and fuck with wasn't a phrase yet, but the feeling was there. That feeling drew me closer and closer to danger every little day. If Mr. Yuck was a scratch and sniff, he'd smell like death wish. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. Um, Next up, we have Moira Egan, whose most recent volume is Amore e Morte, Love and Death, a bilingual new and selected poems, Edizione Tion Rome. Her work has been published in journals and anthologies on four continents. She has been a Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation Fellow at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts and has held writing fellowships at the St. James Cavalier Center for Creativity in Malta and the Civelta Ranieri Center, the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center, and the James Merrill House. She currently teaches creative writing at St. Joseph's, St. St. Stephen's School, sorry, Rome. Welcome, Moria. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. I think it's okay if you mix up the saints because it's, it's not a religious school at all. <laughs> so um, thank you all for being here and thanks Cassandra for the invitation. Um, it's it's uh, despite my tiredness for which I apologize. This is a lovely evening, and I'm really glad to be part of it. Um, Cassandra mentioned that for whatever reason, and I can explain lots of reasons. The sense of smell has always been <laughs> a, an important element in my in my poetry. Uh, mostly good smells, but sometimes not. And I think it's interesting that, of course, we all know that that's the sense of smell is, is the one that's most directly linked to memory. You know, just zoop, zips past conscious thought and takes you back to that flashback. And in, in a certain sense, ha ha, uh, the, I, I, I was inspired to write these, I consider them ekphrastic poems 
and I, I know this is a, 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 a concept much, um, let's say, well used and bandied about by, by people in this group, that a fragrance, that a perfume is a made thing that required thought and sensitivity and development. And so when I had this amazing flashback smelling my husband's Halston Z14 from the 1980s, which he dug out from under the bathroom sink. And I really, I just, boom, I went back there and, and he looked at me and said, where did you go just then? And I said, New York, underage, 19. And this poem came out of that. And this was really the first one that I wrote from the book Synesthesium, which is also the, this is the little bilingual version of just the smelly poems. So all that said, and you can probably guess who the famous person who makes an appearance in this little piece might be. Um, so this is Halston Z14. The sidewalk, bergamot, adrenaline, these velvet bastion ropes, though post heyday and frayed, might well keep you from getting in. And will he check ID? You're underage. The bouncer doesn't ask, you slip right through. A sigh, a breath of cinnamon, a sprig of jasmine from the hedge. The powers you, and there he is in front of you, gray wig, arms folded, skinny avatar of cool. He looks at you, he smiles and tilts his head. An honor, though they'll give you shit at school. And in nine years, this icon will be dead because you left with amber eyes whose moss and musk and leather jacket slung across his shoulders, lust. It's sort of a sonnet, which is also something of a sort of a thing that I do pretty often. Um, this is, let's just say an elegiac sonnet for a professor who was an absolute badass. Um, and one of whose most important lessons imparted to me is included in in the middle part of this poem. Um, it's named after the fragrance Lamp Black, which is a very odd fragrance, the notes of which you'll hear and maybe even smell in here. Um, this, my professor was Cynthia McDonald. If you don't know her work, you should find it. So this is Lamp Black. A hurricane knocked out our power once. Those weeks I read by oil lamp, wrote till late, and dreamed of Mary Roth and Dickinson. The smoke curled up and left a smear of soot. She'd told me that the poets who are blocked are those who could not play as children, maimed. Too well I know you can't turn back the clock, ergo adulthood full of tricks and games, stiletto skipping down Manhattan's walks, no crack, no break, no back, encased in latex, that orchidaceous rubbery bouquet, the glitter of the night street glass in asphalt. Tonight, the sky is black and pepper crisp. The moon has never seemed so spherical, blood orange or rufous grapefruit, which the eclipse dissevers slice by slice, methodical. Actually, a friend of mine, thank you. A friend of mine posted those lines on Facebook after having gotten a copy of this book. Um, and a couple people wrote, said, oh, that sounded just like the eclipse we just had. So isn't it nice that eclipses can travel with us, so to speak, um, and dissever slice by slice. In honor of the genre of prose poem, not to mention a wonderful little project that came out of Australia, the anthology Divining Dante, uh, edited by the inimitable Paul Munden and Nessa Omacheni, um, I don't write prose poems, but for some reason, these just, these happened. I'm not going to, I'm just going to read two of them, I think. I'm going to read the naughtier two because they're more fun. But the Like a High Bun, actually, um, it's a prose poem in 99 words. Yes, that was intentional. And then there are notes to the imaginary perfume that I created in the poem that rhyme Terzarima wise, as you go through the through the uh, sequence, this shows you what a bizarrely formal and obsessive poet I am. But that's that's just that. So I will first read Inferno, a night walk in a dark wood, 
heartwood hard and hearkened, the crackle and smoke of a fire just beyond the next hill, balls and caterwauls of distant beasts, leopard, lion, wolf, the rank skank of sex and ego, pheromones and fear. You want what you want, slow-mo slog through sloth through sloth, a sudden brush of breeze clicks through the black leaves, a wickedly strabismal glint of topaz. You have never felt so lost in all your life. So you take the hand offered where you will go is even deeper, darker, the sulfurous scent of descent. Top notes, smoke, rafflesia, fleur du mal, middle notes, asphodel, oud, camphor, base notes, hyracium, tar, phenol. So you've just gone to hell. I hope it wasn't too bad. Now we'll just take a little journey into purgatory. The slippery slope, the lemon, light or dark, which pulls you more? The sunset shadows dance, seductive, red, white, black, pride, prick and prickle, price or praise. What did you covet? What then did you crave? Just pull away the way you know you should. Oh, guilt of pleasure, pleasure, guilt, the gate, the sweaty climb, sublime, the primrose hill, presume, preclude, pre -due. Your epic dreams, wrong epic, gates of ivory and of horn. You postulant, you penitent, you fragile, flagellant, you black strap whip. The deep rose speaks so sweetly, yet too well you know its thorns. And this smelly thing is top notes, damascena, pomegranate, vetiver, middle note, indole, leather, frankincense, base notes, opaponax, sandalwood, myrrh. That one doesn't smell as bad as the Inferno, I think. And to end on, I, I, I think if we made this perfume, it would smell okay. Um, this was one of my very first smelly poems. Um, it's probably older than some of you in the audience. Um, and it really does take the, this idea of the top note, the middle note, the bass note, um, as a kind of metaphor for a deepening relationship or falling in love. <clears throat> it's been read at some weddings, including my own in various languages. So this is just notes on a potion. Top note, attar of roses. No one ever thought to bring me blush roses before. How can this color so luscious seem so innocent? Buttered ivory dipped in primrose and they open slow as a honeycomb or the tentative blossoming of trust. Middle note, sandalwood. In the dusk, I stumble over roots and shadows he insists in a whisper that we press on. Then he takes my hand and teaches me the names of the flowers in the dark of the deepest heartwood. Base note, ambergris. The fluke breaks the surface smooth as grace or amniotic song. Salt, sweet, water. There are things I have grown used to needing, but never grow used to. His arms warm around me, the long migration home. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Moira. We all want to be guided home in some way or other, right? <laughs> uh, next, we hear from Donna de la Pierre, who is the author of five collections of poetry, three books, works of love and terror, Saint Erasia and True Crime, all from Talisman House, as well as two chapbooks, Night Calendar from Omerta in 2018 and First Love, from the Poetry Center Chapbook Exchange Collection 2013. Um, Donna's work has appeared in journals such as American Letters and Commentary, Brooklyn Rail, Colorado Review, Denver Quarterly, Five Fingers Review, Interim Mantis, New American Writing, and Vault, as well as anthologies such as Kindergard, uh, Plays, Stories, and Songs for Children, Poems, Plays, Stories, and Songs for Children, No Gender, Reflections on Life and the Work of Kari Edwards, and Bay Poetics. She's the recipient of a 2009 Fund for Poetry Award and 2016 Creative Work Grant from the Intersection for the Arts. She founded and curated the Bay Area Poetry Marathon Reading Series 2004 to 2019 in San Francisco. She teaches at San Francisco State University and lives in Oakland with poet Joseph Lees and the Cats, Whitman and Dickinson. 
Welcome, Donna. Hi, everyone. Uh, could our cats' names be any more predictable? And you, you can imagine the interesting um, things that the, the cat related things that we say to them that, that when we're referring to Whitman and Dickinson end up sounding uh, very interesting. Um, so thank you to uh, Mark and Cassandra and Jonathan for uh, bringing us all together today and to uh, the glorious Megan in particular for including me here. Um, I'm gonna do a quick uh, selected chronological tour through uh, my most recent book, which is Works of Love and Terror. And I, I feel bad that, uh, that none of them, well, I don't know that any of them specifically refer to, uh, to scent, but I think that uh, you can very easily imagine them all infused with some uh, combination of uh, dusty, attic, uh, dank Georgia basement, in uh, somewhere between say 1965 and 1978 and uh, hospitals. I think that if you, if, you, <laughs> if, you, if you imagine some combination of those, you, you should hit it right. Um, and although I am no screen sharing expert, I'm gonna give it a whirl uh, today. So here we go. Let's see if I can make this work. There we are. All right, so um, this poem uh, opens the book and is written uh, in response to the work of Yayoi Kusama. For you who are being obliterated, you enter a space. It is the closest thing to not having a body. Lights blink on and off intermittently. Darkness hangs from cables overhead. Everything is becoming erased around you. You must determine how to walk to the exit. You must determine whether the exit exists. Lights are hung on dark cables. They glow or change with color. The walls are mirrors reflecting an exit, assuming, of course, there is an exit. There is a stunning, yawning vertigo. There is magic. There are fireflies. Wouldn't you love to walk through this? Wouldn't you love its blackness and polish? Um, most of this book was written uh, during the final years of my mother's life um, when she was living uh, in the place where I grew up, which is about 50, I think, miles from where Megan is right now um, in Athens, Georgia. And um, this poem, among others, is informed by uh, that emergency. The body fights time, keeps making its plans, and all the while death ticks on in the calendar. The vital carts ping, little moments of slippage, the catch and the whir of my mother's sick breathing. Honestly, hospitals don't bother me much. I grew up in them, loved the clean endlessness of the hallways, the cafeteria's small containers of jello or soft beans. And already this sounds like a poem that is moving toward a clever, though difficult and hard won cohesion, the kind that might makes your mother, who likes Billy Collins, feel safe, the kind that makes us believe in redemption and thus in lies. They give my mother one of the big rooms, they hook her up, make her comfortable. They remove her soiled clothing, but leave the shit smell. I tear pages out of a kid's book about a child bear to write this down. Uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in uh, Georgia, which probably at least in part explains this next poem. Hereditament. There are, for example, houses most no longer standing. There are old cars and animals, stained linens and steeples. There are stairways and worn out clothes. In addition, there are cancers, there is cardiology, there are shock treatments, there is a very full basement. 
There are scratched corneas and high arches, a great uncle who drinks. There are shutters and there are blinds and there are graveyards and pastures. There is infestation, there is black mold, there are moths and destroyed carpets, there is dry rot, brick, mortar, damage to roofs, lives, bones, people. There are mouse and bird skeletons sifting dust behind plaster, carcasses of pets wrapped in towels beneath the deep sod of various yards. There are shadows weeping in bedrooms, there are shut doors, there is keening, there is the beloved's grave collapsing inward one fine June day in 1966, which brings the daughter home from a birthday party before the cake is served. There are dying fathers. There is regret. There are gunshots and fallen bodies. There is all of that. There is none of it. This is only the beginning. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I will actually skip that one. Uh, the Garden. This poem um, is about living in the Bay Area in the 21st century. They lived in a city built on air. Each day the topography recalibrated, shifted into another arrangement. What were hills became clouds, what were clouds became harrows, what were harrows became vacantness, polished and fixed. They had ideals and a certain willingness to make irrevocable choices against a backdrop of catastrophe, ground shifting underfoot. Dervishes hurtled above the hills on filaments of money, panic stinging the daylight beneath its bright burned ceiling. Sung on the eve of the body's destruction. Out past the eyes, unraveling hollow, you shadow time, flicker the screen. Your green hands and fierce skin ghosting the highways, the darkening feels, the torched clap of our quickening. When I imagine you starlings crash the horizon, your hand taps my shoulder, you say you want something. You say you're resigned, you say you can't help it. You flood and then parch, there, not there, taut and lingering. Your stone eyes and stone heart, the drag of your timber, kilned bones, cupped hands, the grass strings of your throat. I never feel you, just the breath of your passage, a mistral, a night squall, only I and dogs can hear. It's a bad sonnet, a sacking, an ill wind, a ghost town. Now lie there, bed made, oh my own phantom limb. High up on the breakers, past the bridge you call someday, there's the body's destruction, the last thing I'll see. And it was never a lesson, only a flat blank burning. When dawn breaks the fields, when light shreds the horizon, just let it be over. Just let us lie still. Um, when I was writing this poem, I was thinking a lot about uh, two things, uh, sound orchestration and also uh, growing up female in the 20th century. <clears throat> Mock trial world. Pretty integer says, come and play, says, dirty girl says, thumb stump says, wrap up your troubles in the old kit bag and swallow. Smile, 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 smile. Flailing Jimmy goes, tilt a whirl goes, fleece a daisy paints, shimmy mock trial. Flint's fairy toning then tears out a spigot, hammering, wheedling up in the craw. Time tilts wise, runs thunderfall, flicker, flies off at angles, unfurling the flaw, unwinds, divvies bad faith, quick, get your money's worth, tearing, teeming, fast overground. Harbinger cover, lean in, hear the hard sell, tethering, wheeling, sliced silly pawn, be a good girl, a target, 
a hard luck, a hammer, salt seed, plant ashes, then all fall down. Um, this poem was written uh, on a flight between Atlanta, Georgia and San Francisco. <clears throat> Excuse me, up in the air. Somewhere over Colorado, George Clooney tells the ingenue that everyone dies alone. Someone has been drinking whiskey and is by now maybe just possibly a little drunk. Lights blink out inside the plane. Outside, the night slides out of purple into black. You can still see outlines of the clouds, but just barely. For the past 90 minutes, a woman two rows up has been lifting pieces of her hair strand by strand. Every fourth strand she yanks with a little intake of breath. By the time the sky has gone dark, the screen ingenue is crying and someone is saying, a nice smile is all. A nice smile might just do it. I am trying to say fire. What are you trying to say? I am trying to say fire. I am trying to say immaculate. I am trying to mean it. I am trying to say God. I am trying to say heaven. I am trying to say dark, to say, look here, we're burning. Night calendar. On the roof, 2 a.m., sickle moon whips the wind, the train whistle downtown, the cat eye parsed courtyard, fog outside dark windows, the shadow batten ceiling. Heart says, just this, just this, just this, just this. Prayer. When the rain stops, everything beside the river gathers tension. 92 stars in the night sky, 92 roads to go home. In the hull of the body, an atom's eruption and dispersal, a siren blasting a warning as piercing as God. It's October and children hang crepuscular sheets in the orchard, little lambs, little scatter, little tarnish in the bowl. When we call a body a vessel, we call a vessel a star, we call a star a loose blast from the deep empty to nowhere. In the darkened room, a mother repeats, I love you, I love you. That is all she remembers. That is all she can say. The cross above her head, a string and cup phone to the night sky, a shell to the ear, through which she hears the largest ocean. I think I'll skip that one. Um, and this next to uh, last poem uh, that I'll read today uh, was written for my mother, Frances Jenkins and all the other radiant old women. Mayor. The old women rose with the moon twisting their gnarled arms across the sky. They hovered over the places they had walked. They passed the houses where they had lived as girls, the dark pine arched roads where they had received first kisses and clutched at boys or other girls in the quickening dark. They passed the hospitals or rooms where they had birthed children. They passed the graves of children. They passed their own graves. They tore light out of the stars and wore it as cloaks. Other light they flung to earth where it split apart and scattered. They crowned each other with the wrecks of their longings and despair. They fell apart, cohered again. They spun with the weather. They watched the world flame out, ignoring them at best or hating them. They rose over the ridge like a troop of fixed stars. And uh, last one, Works of Love and Terror, which is also the last poem of the book. The last several years, I've been going to a lot of volcanoes 
At the edge, ash tastes like memory, as memory tastes like water. You feel a kind of concreteness, fields of love and catastrophe. Infinity flings a wide net, then pulls itself in. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. And thus, we shall move on to Megan Volpert, who is the initiator of the Perfume Show. Uh, Megan is the author and editor of over a dozen books on popular culture, including two Lambana Literary Award finalists and an American Library Association honoree. Her newest work is Perfume from Bloomsbury, and she won the Georgia Author of the Year for the Bross, uh, sorry, Boss Broad from Sibling, Rise, Rib, Rib, uh, Sibling Rivalry Press. Um, Megan is a part-time assistant professor of interdisciplinary studies at Kennesaw State University and a fellow at the American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought. She writes for Pop Matters and has edited anthologies of philosophical essays on the music of Tom Petty and the television series RuPaul's Drag Race. Welcome, Megan. Thank you for having me. Thank you for hosting Mark and Cassandra. I appreciate you so much. And what a fun time this has been. I love so much when uh, my, my, my participation in an event causes other people to think more deeply about how to live a fragrant life and how to write about it as well, you know? And so I just, I just love, I soak up all these new influences. I see where they meet with mine. I think, I think you guys will enjoy um, the, some of the weird connections that are gonna pop up between what I have to read for you and the things we've already just heard. Um, uh, each of these is a short excerpt from a different section of my new book, which is Perfume from Bloomsbury, available now. And uh, so, yeah, I just have four little tidbits for you. Each of them clocks in at like just under three minutes. Um, we're going to go sort of chronologically through my schooling. So we'll meet me as an eighth grader, and then we will finish with my last year as a high school English teacher. <laughs> In the spring of 1994, I was an eighth grader glued to the television as tributes to dearly departed Kurt Cobain began rolling out. The Messiah had gone, but his message of grunge continued to proliferate everywhere. And for a few years, it was possible for young women to wear Doc Martens and flannel shirts without everybody presuming they were lesbians. We dressed like dudes. Everybody wore the same perfume. CK1. CK1. Barely fragrant, but massively ideological. The ad campaign was starkly minimalist, black and white with almost no sound, just a motley crew of long-haired people in roughed up jeans and unbuttoned flannels quietly slouching around looking semi-confrontationally at the camera. Through this marketing, my 13-year-old brain instantly processed the foundational postmodern idea that there is no difference between a man and a woman. CK1 was the first fragrance explicitly marketed as unisex. Calvin Klein went to Fermentich and asked the firm to make something that could be worn by anyone, he said. Alberto Morias and Harry Fremont proceeded to craft an aromatic citrus fragrance that defined the lowest common denominator of perfume, basically a vodka tonic with a lemon twist. At its peak, CK1 was turning a profit of more than $90 million annually. Despite its very light touch, the original contained more than 20 notes that could be pushed and pulled in so many directions that Maurice and Fremont were ultimately able to spawn about a dozen flankers. These were each branded in ways that carried forward the missions of grunge, even though explicit associations with 90s counterculture were quickly dialed down. CK all, CK everyone, CK1 graffiti, CK1 summer, CK1 Chinese New Year, and many special collectors edition bottles. The Grunge Association ultimately had to go because Kevin Klein realized that he had launched the world's easiest office scent. CK1 has rather sadly and even ironically ended up as the official cologne of unobtrusive corporate employees everywhere. Telegraphing an aura of team player, it whispers proof that one can take care of one's presentation of self, but that the presentation shall not be complicatedly fussy or generally loud, and it is most definitely not sexy. It understands what is appropriate for a workplace environment. Human resource, de resource departments approve of CK1, which is about as anti-grunge as you can get. But there I sat, 
on the cusp of puberty, imagining how my girlhood might dissolve before my very nose into this total gender revolution that at least for one moment, CK1 truly was. And I never even bought a bottle. The ideas in the ad campaign were enough to activate me. Okay, so that's number one. With warm vanilla sugar from Bath and Body Works, I began to apply the ideas of a scent and to better understand myself as a result. Already by age 15, I was a profoundly wounded person, cut down by poverty, by the failure of my parents, the impotence of their rages, by politics of the Reagan era that I was born into, by a world that wants to take everything from a girl, by social isolation, the consequence-laden oppression of my fledgling queerness, by everything. The things that steadied me, banned books, punk rock, the debate team, and the unerring conviction that someday my giftedness would set me free. My open mouth was a knife edge. My attitude oozed from every pore. And on top of all this, I swam in a cloud of warm vanilla sugar. <laughs> this was a scent so sweet and so welcoming, so much a snuggly teddy bear that it stood in clear contrast to all the visual and verbal signaling that I was a big bad monster. It lulled people gave them a false sense of security before the tongue lashing, advertising my innocence that I revoked with any and every word that I uttered. It centered, warmed, comforted me so that I could focus on staying alive. It lingered in a room long after I departed, catching everyone in my wide blast radius. It announced me, it was persistent. It left people surprised or confused by the mixed messaging. Warm vanilla sugar was camouflage and it was armor at the same time. It was my business card and it was my trademark. But in working like mad to escape my situation in the 90s, I was in many ways using warm vanilla sugar as a cloak of avoidance. Bent on survival, on getting the hell out of Chicago, I made no move to analyze or to evaluate myself too deeply. So badly was I hurting that I felt nothing toward others that I in turn had hurt, ignoring my body count that I was racking up so that I could save myself. The innate human tenderness inside of me had no room to flourish. And so in retrospect, the irony is frankly crystal clear. During all my youthful perseverance, warm vanilla sugar was the anchor to a humanity that I could otherwise not afford to show. And as I approach middle age, it is impossible really to avoid noticing how some of the necessary meannesses of my youth have congealed into my character. There are a lot of vanillic gourmand fragrances that appeal to me because I am still in many ways chasing my own sweetness. Here's the third bit. We move along to graduate school. <laughs> scent is an archive for memory, yet scent itself cannot really be archived except with great difficulty. If one wants to smell something the way it smelled 200 years ago, one should go to the many small local perfumers all over the world who for decades and occasionally even for centuries have avoided mainstream branding and marketing. These are families that have handed their formulas down generations of bloodline. Their secret recipes can usually be enjoyed cheaply like those at Bourbon French perfumes. The good people at Bourbon French have been in the French Quarter in New Orleans since August Dusson set up shop there in 1843. And any generous 10 milliliter sample bottle is a mere $9. This means that you can try literally everything they have ever made for a grand total of less than 900 bucks. And I believe over the years that I pretty well have. <laughs> the samples that I like most, I get in 120 milliliter bottles for under $40 each. This includes the legendary Eau de Cologne that was worn by Napoleon, the incense musk of Eau de Noir, and Olive Blossom. The bourbon French interpretation of olive blossom is how I ended up going to them in the first place. I acquired a scent memory that I became desperate to find in a bottle. While attending graduate school in Baton Rouge behind the library at Louisiana State University, there was this alcove that always was just wonderfully redolent with the smell of sweet olive growing nearby. And I wanted to be able to capture that. I wanted to be able to control the frequency with which I could feel all the things that I felt inside of that scent. And it came to stand in for that extremely formative three years of my life. So I combed the internet for renderings of sweet olive. And then I realized the raw materials, of course, could only be sourced from Louisiana for authenticity's sake. There are only so many perfumers that are in the state. And so when I contacted Mary Belhar, I knew she was the one. Mary, who has owned the shop since 1991, walked me through their options. Sweet Olive versus Olive Blossom versus Evermore, and ultimately sent me all three so I could decide which one more closely resembled my memory in a bottle. 
Evermore included the Stephanotis flower often mistaken for sweet olive. My money was on sweet olive itself, but the focus on the sugar and the wax of the flower was not right. Whereas olive blossom captured not only the flower, but the green of the whole plant. That was a good surprise. And still I use it like the flux capacitor in Back to the Future. Anytime I need to reminisce about the person I used to be or summon her forth to vanquish new challenges for which honestly she is sometimes better equipped than the person I am now, that olive blossom perfume has proven very efficacious medicine worth keeping close at hand for emergency. And here is the last one, which is about once I got out of other people's classrooms and got into my own. During the pandemic, I was masked up while essential working due to the presence of about a hundred other student bodies spending an hour at a time in my 35 by 35 foot windowless cinder block classroom each day. So I kept wearing fragrances that would be considered ridiculous bold choices, scents that were decidedly not safe for work. The office is supposed to be a quiet place where nobody is intruded upon by the loud perfumes of others. It is a shared public space that still clings to some uh, very mythic notion of individual olfactory privacy. But there I was, sweaty with the anxiety of stumbling into, did I just get infected? Moments of paranoia a hundred times every single day. Sometimes nothing made me feel sane or able to soldier on, except now and then surrendering myself to the overwhelming, overpowering embrace of Guerlain's bluish hour or Montal's full incense seeping in through my face mask. I kept to scents that offered syrupy warmth and ancient everlastingness that supersaturated the air around me with smoke and flowers, a percolation of thick comfort that felt like it might, it might help defend my vulnerable personal space against the invading virus. And the kids liked it too. If they were going to risk leaving the safety of their quarantine bubble to be in my company for an hour, getting a good whiff of some super weird perfume that they'd never get to smell at home was about honestly the most reasonable adventure available to any of us at the time. My main daily audience of teenagers has an innate respect for the not so polite perfumes, either because their own shelf is limited to Axe and Febreze or because they're still figuring out how much they like to slap on in the morning. So there is a certain sublimity in overdoing it and just owning that, like walking into a trendy restaurant in the 80s doused in Giorgio Beverly Hills, weaponizing oneself, launching into the probability of notice by others. It is youthful. It is even a merciless attitude, a joyous instigation of possible aesthetic conflict, uh, a strategy for swinging away at immortality, I think. And I did use it to establish control over my students, to telegraph to them important messages about our classroom vibe for the day. Big citrus energy when introducing a new concept, white flowers and fresh greens for getting into the thick of things, leather on deadline day, fruit and amber to smooth any difficult one-on-one -on -one conversations. An administrator once walked into my classroom and paused halfway in. He asked whether something was burning. <laughs> but he'd, he'd simply caught a whiff of my black pepper top note, and I could see in his expression that he was undergoing some kind of very pointed emotional terrorism in that moment. And the first thing that popped into my mind is how Cleopatra is supposed to have perfumed the sails of her ships. Imagine the effect that this would have on those waiting at the port, the legendary and long-awaited ship emerging gradually over the horizon line, then suddenly waves of myrrh and cinnamon and cardamom, so strong that they overtake the smell of the sea itself. Especially in the context of the first impressions of an empress, this is a brutal, intoxicating display of power. So shocking, it would transfix the memory instantly. Thank you for having me. Namaste, fantastic, Megan. And so, well, we're so delighted to have had this amazing potpourri of, of authors writing on, on the sense of smell. And thank you again, Henry and Moira and uh, Megan and Donna for this wonderful reading. And I'm now gonna hand it over to Cassandra to guide us through more olfactory senses in our open mic.
Yeah, as long as I think I was saying to you, as long as it's not the kind of Patrick Suskind kind of perfume, because that one's just super creepy, but super interesting. Um, so first up, we have the amazing Leslie, who reads for us occasionally and always knocks us over with uh, with something wonderful. So Leslie, please unmute and share your poem with us. Thanks, Cassandra. And of course, I can live up to that introduction. No sweat. Of course you can. <laughs> so um, this poem actually has the word fragrance in it, but it is merely fortuitous. Uh, and um, by the way, the readings were great. They were just great today. Thank all of you, all of you in the features. Uh, I, I loved it. Um, okay, so the context of this poem is that I wrote it last year, uh, which was the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And of course we were in full pandemic swing. So it's called Memory. The longest, the most cerulean September week equaled only by the sky, the April, my brother died. The same hard spines of the rock ridge edging up against the dirt, encircling the butterfly bush. I found a soft brown velvet bag, the word to fill in embroidered in old red and gold on the cover. It has almost no associations for me, only that it is clearly homemade raises my tenderness. It was obviously fall, hard yellow and black marked wings flying into the sweet cones of the bulia. Cellars 70 feet deep filled with toxic ash and bodies. Remember? Neither of my grandfathers was religious in just that way, especially not my father's father. Perhaps it belonged to my great grandfather, my mother's, my grandmother's father after all. My mother and I sat in perfect amity for hours perfectly silent, watching the heady fragrance clusters that attracted more and more butterflies, falling wings beating, sounds of longing for before, when all seemed whole. A scrap of hard blue and gold upholstery fringe borders the bottom of the bag, spiraled against a moment, an hour of tranquil silence on that unyielding plastic chair on the stoop, holding the cold receiver from the handset. Just the two of us, silent, quiet for once, together alone from the broken heart of September, canceling the flight that week, that month, year, but still, quiet on my front walk in the long afternoon of chrysanthemums, of butterfly bush, spiky, serene, listening to the bees collecting nectar for the winter hive. Wow, that more than lived up to your introduction. Wow, that was so poignant, so moving. Lines like sounds of longing for before when all seemed whole. So many beautiful moments in there. Thank you, Leslie. What a fantastic way to kick off open mic. Next, we have John Wessick. It's not an open mic without something from John. We get to see a strange picture of what's inside his head. We never know what's coming. John. Thank you, Cassandra. This is a flash fiction piece called My Date with Mitch, but you can call it a prose poem if it no, makes no, you feel they're better. Very, they're very different. I couldn't do that. I'm happy Two cypress that. trees frame the steps leading to Amy's porch. I rang the doorbell and breathed the lush perfume of honeysuckle. It had been a while since I dated and I'd heard things had changed. The door opened. Hi, come in. Amy's complexion glowed with health. She had wrinkles in the corners of her eyes and her lips curled into a perpetual smile as if she shared a secret with the universe. Amy was a physician's assistant. I'd met her at the gym after we discovered a mutual love of Italian neorealism. I'd asked her out. 
She showed me into a ramshackle living room, the kind most working mothers had. This is my daughter, Julie. Hey, Amy's, te Amy's teen daughter lifted her head and then turned back to her smartphone. And who is this? I pointed to a gray haired man with a double chin. He wore a white suit and a string tie. Oh, that's Senator Mitch Buzzkill, Amy said. He'll be joining us because the Supreme Court ruled that all consenting adults intimacy is subject to his whims. Do I have to buy him dinner too, I whispered. Just go along with it, Amy touched my forearm. If we keep him happy, he might leave us alone. It was a Saturday night, so Republican politicians crowded the restaurant with the pandemic that had killed a million Americans, January 6 insurrection, inflation, shortage of baby formula, and war in Ukraine. It was amazing how they find time to chaperone 30 and 40 year old couples. What will you have, ma'am? The waiter asked Amy. Oh, how about the BLT lettuce wrap? Excellent choice, and a drink. Harpoon IPA, and you, sir, I'll have the Bangkok street noodles. I handed the waiter my menu, just water to drink. And you, Senator, I'll start with the foie gras and the Wagyu steak tartare, Buzzkill said. Then bring me the Branzino with a green goddess salad and toss in a bottle of Chateau de Chatelet, too. Too stunned for words, Amy and I sat in silence until the waiter brought our plates. I reached for my fork. Aren't you forgetting something? Buzzkill bowed his head. Dear Lord, we thank you for this bounty. He began shoveling food into his mouth after the amen. I guess nothing works up an appetite like ramming your religion down other people's throats. At least with Buzzkill distracted, Amy and I had a chance to talk. How do you become a physician's assistant anyway, I asked. Earn a master's degree and take a board exam. Amy bit into her lettuce BLT. Oh, this is good. Want a taste? She cut a piece and placed it on my plate. Instead of bacon, it was made with smoked lamb. I tasted aioli and heirloom tomatoes, too. Much better than mine, I said. But Senator Buzzkill's meal was better than both of ours. A reduction of figs and balsamic topped his foie gras. His steak tartare came with fresh wasabi and shaved radish. And the fish was broiled to protection. His salad was a salad. Graduate school was a struggle as a single mom, especially after Ron died. Amy reached for another lettuce wrap, but Buzzkill beat her to it. Waiter, Buzzkill yelled, another bottle of Chateau de Chatelot. I needed to take out a second mortgage to cover the senator's meal and that of his two Secret Service bodyguards who trailed him like a pair of remoras. The night was young, so I suggested a movie. I want to see everything everywhere all at once, Amy said. Negative, Buzzkill said. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is more in line with my family values. So he watched a movie about a video game character while Senator Buzzkill sat between us, rustling candy wrappers, guzzling soft drinks, and gorging on popcorn. At evening's end, he allowed me to kiss Amy goodnight. Keep your hands where I can see them, he said, and no tongue. Once she was safely inside, he handed me a campaign pamphlet. Hope you'll donate to the RNC. Unlike those Democrats, we're the party of personal freedom. Well, got to go round up the riot squad. Kids have been playing hopscotch in front of Senator Collins' house again. My date with Mitch. I love it. I love it. You've made me hungry. I think I've got my breakfast sorted out. But Senator Buzzkill, what a character. Absolutely loved it. Always great to hear from you, John. Next, we have another favorite, DeWitt. He's got so many poems to select that he could possibly read. I'm on the edge of my own chair, not as divine as DeWitt's chair, but I'm on the edge of it anyway, not quite knowing what he's going to read us, but knowing it's going to be fantastic. So DeWitt, please unmic, unmute. Bingo. Excellent. Um, I first heard of uh, Diane Ackerman's natural history of the senses, which I think is any, any writer's Bible when it comes to sensory imagery. And I didn't hear about it from another writer 
or literary writer. I heard about it from an advertising writer. <laughs> um, but it's mentioned in this poem along with, of course, Shakespeare. Um, and uh, I was particularly fascinated by, by Megan's Cleopatra. This is called On Rank. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds, the poet writes, warning that aristocrats who sink like Falstaff to self-indulgence, villainy, and cowardice are more offensive than peasants who lack their opportunities in breeding. Macbeth agrees. If you're not in the worst rank of manhood, say it. Likewise, Dante with his hierarchy of sins and sinners, and even William Empson. If WH has festered, that at least makes him a lily and at least not a stone. If he is not a lily, he is in less danger of festering. From private to general, military ranks confer authority and duty. Festering is cause for being demoted, stripped of rank, or cashiered. Unions have their rank and file, led by elected officers. When officers clash with management, they order members out on strike. To rankle is to upset in anger. A rank amateur is one with less skill and experience than pros. The ablest weaver, tinker, carpenter, or tailor is clueless about performing plays. Dyer's sons are upstart crows. Rank suggests, along with relative standing, that breakers of rank stink in their attempts. Well, the smell is the mute sense, according to Diane Ackerman. English seems weaker than others for ranking rankness. According to popular science, an indigenous Malaysian language describes smells as precisely as English describes colors. Smells may reek, be pungent, stale, sour, rancid, putrid, fulsome, rotten, sulfurous, noxious, disgusting, nauseating, <laughs> suffocating, unbearable. Hey, you. We cover mouths and noses at the stench, gag like garbage men or like cops examining a corpse. Funeral flowers, especially lilies, cover the corruption. And then there's the Titan Arum, AKA corpse flower that rarely blooms and briefly smelling like rotten meat to attract the flies that pollinate it. No one wordplay like DeWitt and makes it so entertaining. He is the king of wordplay. In fact, when I was in Japan, they have wonderful shops called Ranking and Rang Queen. And, um, and I always um, think of that when I hear that piece because I love the play. That's so much a part of that and the enjoyment of it. Thank you. We have Bob beaming in from his kitchen. It's great to see him there. It's great to have the kitchen looking similar every week or our lives would be uh, chaotic, I think. So, Bob, what are you going to read us? Okay, uh, this is an older information piece. Information. The poem, the, oh, oh sorry, sorry. In the poem, the bear was shaped like a mailbox, the woman like a cup full of salt. In the poem, the dirt spoke more quickly than they could understand. In the poem, they were the dirt, the bear, the woman. But when they were opened, the numbers that spilled out were different from what they had expected. They had no meaning that corresponded with any truth. Did it again, another brilliant one. How do you open a poem with the bear was shaped like a mailbox? I don't know, but Bob always makes it work. It's brilliant. Thank you. 
Thank you. And we're going to close open mic the way that I like to close it. And that's with Cindy, who always has something for us to think about and to enjoy. Cindy, Sister Cindy. Thank you. I love this reading. This was a stellar reading, the features and the open micers. Um, I'm going to read something from my I Am the Girl series. I probably read this one before. The I Am the Girl series is loosely based on Ann Waldman's um, fast speaking woman, where she says, I am a bird woman. I am, so I did, I am the girl. I am the girl with the badass band. I am the girl with the suck it up face. I am the girl with her face in the soup. I am the girl with her fingers in the pie. I am the girl with the smoke and the mirrors. I am the girl with the cookies and cream. I am the girl on the merry-go-round. I am the girl who frightens the clowns. I am the girl with the harpoon in her tongue. I am the girl with the boilerplate bones. I am the girl who's the Jew in the mosque. I am the girl with all the commandments. I am the girl who started the fire. I am the girl who is sometimes a liar. I am the girl who preaches to the choir. I am the girl who was damned at the altar. I am the girl who melted the ice caps. I am the girl who changed the climate. I am the girl who rides your coattails. I am the girl who drinks your cocktails. I am the girl who throws the bombshells. I am the girl with the Russian words. I am the girl with the Kremlin mouth. I am the girl who serves the subpoenas. I am the girl with the slam dunk case. Thank you. <laughs> and that's why Cindy is the badass poet that she is. No one can finish open mic quite like quite like Cindy. I like the girl with the suck it up face myself, but there are so many great lines. Um, and I, I agree. Um, Megan put in the chat that that whole poem should be on a black t-shirt and I say let's do it and let's all wear it it would be great but Mark back to you for a summing up and a sneak peek of what we've got coming up so well first of all thank you again uh, Megan Henry Donna and Moira um, next week we have an interesting show with Mary Jo Bang Charles Fort Kate Gale and Fred Marchand and the week after that we have I Want to Be Loved by You poems on Marilyn Monroe, which features something like 20 different poets, including David Lehman, Lynn Andrews, C.A. Conrad, Anthony Gibbons, uh, George Gida, Karen Newberg, and many more. So do join us for those two shows. So for tonight, um, I'm going to read you a little poem about Venice. Um, that was written by Klaus Matz, the Swiss poet, which I've just recently translated. Um, and it goes like this. It didn't surprise me, father called today on this bleary December day. And Venice still displays herself in the window, this inexhaustible city. On the telephone, I would use the word serenissima. Father would spell it out later and no one would hold it against him. A Venetian whose Venetian soul listened by chance, possibly walked toward him, corrected him in a friendly fashion. Se, re, nisima. They broke into conversation, spoken, a spoken form of Esperanto, as it would be spoken among those of a similar disposition. Even mum chuckled. My brother, alienated after the first few words, beamed from his entire face. In this way, on this winter's day, I made new friends up in heaven and promised to distribute those wild and well-traveled kisses to these, our own grown-up children, and also to my adoring wife who divides our organic way of life, the bright days and the labyrinthine pathways, the floods, and the crucifixions, the flight of the angels throughout the city, and who, under her icy rule of law, make us 
raise our cups to the screech of the seagulls. And so I thank you all for a wonderful reading on vapors and scents and perfumes and smells which will guide us in our senses much further than many of the others. Thank you so much for poetry, for love, and for sense tonight. Good night. Good night. Peace, love, and perfume. Mwah. Night. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>